Hi, I'm Jennifer Wiggum. And I'm Zach Glazer. And this is episode 526 of The Lawyer's Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, Stephanie talks with Matthew Hunt about creating content on LinkedIn. And today's podcast is brought to you by Posh Virtual Receptionists. Yeah. So, Jennifer, I can't ever say virtual receptionists. Why um, not? It's like, it's like the word rural similarly. Jural? I, I try to, yeah, or rural juror. I try to keep rural virtual jural? receptionist uh, uh, or like, yeah, I, I avoid, actively avoid saying similarly in any of my Simil- talks. What do you say instead? I don't a, know. Um, like? Alternatively, just like. Um, um, also. In addition to. In similarly. Addition to, uh, do you think it's our Southern roots? I probably, probably. Well, you know, speaking of Southern roots, we, we just, I just got back from uh, Austin, Texas okay. at ClioCon. Oh yeah. So um, another, another plug for Clio. Uh, but we go to a lot of conferences and, and uh, just to start off, like ClioCon is a very, very good conference. Love going to it. Love seeing all the the attorneys that are there talking about their practices. Love talking to all the other, uh, you know, providers. Always love getting getting caught up with uh, the Clio C-suite and everything, talking to Jack Newton and whatnot. But, you know, it always makes me think of like, what's the value of going to a conference, mm. you know, what do, what do we get out of it? I, when I was practicing, it, it would have taken me a lot to take time away from my practice to go to any sort of conference. I mean, like I, I, when I was practicing, I didn't even go to ABA tech show and I was very into you know, legal hmm. tech. Why didn't you go? I mean, what was it just taking? Like, it felt like you didn't know what the value was. It felt like wasted. Like what, what was the like, light bulb moment that made you realize conferences are actually super useful. Well, so I I think I'm still pondering this. Mm. I'm still kind of working around with this one because I I go to a bunch of conferences um, and I I do find value in them. But, you know, when you when you wind up working at the conference, you're doing work, you're answering emails, you're you're getting a bunch of stuff done, you're trying to go to the conference and practice law at the exact same time or, or do your job at the exact same time. I think that's when you don't get real major value out of it yeah. because you don't immerse yourself in it. And right. I didn't have a practice set up where I could really do that, where I could go immerse. I mean, not even to say the money that it costs to go to these conferences in person, but I, I didn't have the, I didn't have the processes set up to, to give me that time really, I think. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And I, I would say something that I get out of conferences, because I wouldn't have considered myself a conference person either until the past couple of years, is that I get to be around a lot of people doing the same things that I'm doing and thinking about the same things that I'm thinking that I otherwise wouldn't. And it gives me an excuse to really learn a lot from yeah. a bunch of smart people who are interested in the same things. And you just can't get that everywhere. No, you you can't. And I think that's the that's part of what I'm getting at with the you can't go there, try to work in the downtime. Right. And then just go to the things that you're interested in. You you know, in the downtime, it's kind of important to go and and just literally run into people. Yeah, literally. You know, and, 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 and like literally. That's yeah. that's what I do. Um, yeah, I'm sure there over. are people listening to this that got run into by me um at Cleocon. <laughs> um I'm a little clumsy, but I I think like pushing yourself at at the lunch tables, going and sitting with somebody and just saying like, Hey, (laughs) hi, I'm Zach. (laughs) Hey y'all. And this is the lawyer's podcast. (laughs) I'm a hound dog. Um, (laughs) (laughs) If anybody of Zach said that to you at CleoCon, please send me a private message. Would love I mean, to hear about that's, it. Obviously, th- that's from the fox and the hound, not yes. just me. No, I um. I know. I'm, yeah, you're right, though. That's It's been maybe 40 years since that came out. <laughs> okay. But I, I think it's important to go connect with people. I guess it's the, yeah. the people a lot yeah. of times. That's, that's it for me. The hallway conversations, the people, you meet yeah. people. I mean, because you don't get a lot of... It's like in school, you made friends because you were right. trapped together in a building. Mm-hmm. And as adults especially the more we, we work remotely, we don't get trapped together in a building as often. And so conferences are the way to make adult friendships as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. Well, I think another way to make adult friendships is to be very active on LinkedIn. 
Oh, segue. And so now, if you want to do that, if you want to think about that, here is Stephanie's. Well, after my conversation with Posh, here is Stephanie's conversation with Matthew. Hey, y'all. I'm Zach. I'm the legal tech advisor here at Lawyerist. And today I've got Serena Perez with me from Posh Virtual Receptionist. And we are talking, uh, you guessed it, uh, virtual receptionists, but more specifically, kind of the why of virtual receptionists and the the system, because I think a lot of us out there in podcast land and lawyer land um, don't necessarily know when to pull the trigger on a virtual receptionist, or I mean, frankly, a lot of us don't know when to pull the trigger on a receptionist. Um, mm-hmm. So let's kind of talk about the the benefits in that moment where where you know you go from I'm a I'm a one person show, or or I just need a lot more um, receptionist ability. Um, Serena, you know, a welcome to the show. <laughs> it's good to have you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Zach. I'm I'm happy to be back. Thank you again for having me. I really just wanted to touch on today the highlights and the benefits of using our services, no matter how big or how small your firm yeah. is. Maybe you're a startup. Maybe you've been doing this for 30 years. Right. Um, it's definitely a benefit, no matter where you're at in the moment of your career. Um, really, the most important thing why people go looking for an answering service or virtual receptionist service like Posh is missing calls. Right. That yeah. is a missed revenue generating opportunities. 85% of your calls that you're missing, if you call them back, they're not going to answer that call if their first call is not answered. <laughs> uh, right? And that's a big number. That's I mean, you didn't number. answer the phone. You know, they're not going to answer. <laughs> I don't answer right. phone calls from places that that I don't know them. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. They're on to the next. So really first mm. impressions, being available is your number one and growing yeah. your business and growing your firm and growing your clientele. Um, so that's where Posh comes into play, right? Again, no matter how small, no matter how big your firm is, our job and the reason why we're here is to ensure that you never miss a call, right? right. Well, it, you know, but I'm in, I'm in court, I'm in right. depositions, I'm in meetings. My, my, uh, my assistants are doing something else and can't necessarily, um, you know, have that. So, kind of, right. if I'm a one horse, you know, operation, or if I've got a, a bunch of people, like I, I, I might miss calls. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. You just can't do it all. Right. And rather than going through and hiring someone in house, like a receptionist, um, to take those calls, to consider salary, to consider PTO, breaks, vacation, things like that, that's all goes out the window when you're looking at a service like Posh, right? We take care of all of that for you. As far as you know, we're available 24 7, 365 (laughs) days a year. So that's all you got to do. You forward your calls to us to turn us on. You unforward when you want to turn us off. Um, It's as simple as that. Well, that, yeah, that's, that is very simple. But I I also think, you know, the, the vast majority of attorneys in, in the United States are in um, kind of more rural areas because the vast majority of the United States is more rural. And I know being somebody who, who practice in a rural area, it's not easy to go out there and find a, a, you know, high quality um, receptionist who is available during office hours, much Mm -hmm. less. 24-7-365. Right, right. And it is very, you know, hiring, especially in this day and age. (laughs) It is, it's a task in itself, right? So having a service like that kind of takes that responsibility away from you. We'll handle that. And we can do everything and more that an in-house receptionist can. So it's almost as if we are part of that team. That is our goal, to be that front desk, to maintain that composure. We can schedule appointments. We can connect calls to you, depending on your availability, that you can share with us through our app in real time. You can do lead intake with a customizable script, depending on the type of law that you practice, right? Vetting and fielding those leads even takes away that extra step that you have to do when you're making these calls back or maybe even scheduling consultations, whether it's in person or a virtual visit. If you work from home and you don't have an office, these are all possibilities that can be done depending on what you're currently doing internally. Yeah, and and that's just a communication with with Posh, either through the app or or by by calling them as well. I want to kind of hang on that for for a moment of the yeah. that specifically that intake process. I think there are a lot of attorneys that go, oh well, I, I don't I don't have an intake process, so I don't need that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a that's the the wrong conclusion to come to 
when you go to, I don't have an intake process. I don't have an intake process. So maybe I need to make one. Right. Not, right. not I don't need a, I don't need a receptionist who I can put the intake process with. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's for general practitioners. That's for PI, obviously. That's for family law. That's for probate. All mm-hmm. of these, these types of law, no matter what type of law you're in, I guarantee you, you, you can have some sort of intake process that you could be assisted with but by just creating your, you know, creating the set things that you do when you get called by a potential client or mm-hmm. even a current client or the court. You, right. know, you, you get called right. by the court or opposing counsel and a, a virtual receptionist like Posh knows what to do and who to who to send them to. Yes. And it's all based on your preference, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I touched on this last time I visited here, but it's not a one box fits all. Right. You know, it's completely customizable per our client every single time. We have things that if you don't know where to start or how to use a service like this, that's what we're here for, right? right. We have a beautiful sales team that will assist you in getting that set up. But it's really about, all right, what are you doing internally? How can we best implement the service so that it's efficient for your client? experience. When they call, when you turn on that service, we want to make it seem like you have a new front desk receptionist. It's professional, it's accountable, and it's going to help you take away some time from you answering and handling those calls. Well, Serena, once again, thank you for being with me and sharing your knowledge um, about virtual receptionists with our listeners. I I really appreciate it. Um, Obviously, if people want to get connected with Posh, they can go to, you guessed it, Posh.com. That's P-O-S-H.com, where they can get a free trial, right? Yes, yes. And if you mentioned that you are coming from Lawyerist, you get a 14-day free trial. Um, so oh, wow. definitely mention that you heard about us from here. You can either visit our website, you can give us a call, 833-GET-POSH, 833-438-7674. Um, or you can email us if you don't have the time to get on the phone. At sales at posh.com. <laughs> that sounds pretty, pretty easy. And uh, I want to point out that that 14 day free trial is seven days more than the the normal trial that you guys would give. So uh, sure. just another perk of listening to the lawyers podcast and uh, and connecting with Posh. Yes, yes. Thank you again, Zach, for having us. It's been a pleasure. So my name is Matthew. I'm the founder of Demandy. We help busy executives create all of their short form stackable content for social media from a single monthly one hour interview. Hey, Matthew, welcome to the show. Thanks. So I found you on LinkedIn. Honestly, if I'm being real honest, I'm pretty sure I saw you make a comment on someone else's LinkedIn post and was intrigued by your title the idea of snackable content. Um, and I know that you help you help people figure out what to do on LinkedIn. Is that one of the things that you, you're focused on? Yeah, that is the only thing I'm focused on okay. right now. <laughs> All right. I wasn't sure about your intro because I was like, I thought it was mostly LinkedIn. So yeah, that makes sense. It is. Yeah. I mean, people do syndicate it to other platforms because they all work the same, you know, to some degree when it comes to social media and short form content is short form content. However, you know, our unique proposition is that we focus on LinkedIn as our angle to get into creating social media content. Awesome. And so maybe some people might be thinking LinkedIn, are we really still talking about LinkedIn? Is it, is it, is it relevant? Like what, what's your answer to why business owners should still be on LinkedIn and paying attention there? So, well, one, if you're a business owner, you're probably the founder or the president or the owner or however you want to title yourself, you know, CEO, it doesn't really matter. Um, Your number one asset is actually yourself, but your biggest obstacle is time. And so any time that you can multiply yourself where you can share more of your mission, your vision and your values, that is a good use of your time. In fact, I would even argue that it's irresponsible not to take an hour per month to do that. And if you are one of those individuals, then you're being watched. And one of the places that you're being watched is LinkedIn. So I think that you have to do that today in today's marketplace. And you have to show up on social media in general, like LinkedIn, and share those things. Uh, People are not mind readers. And generally speaking, the more you do that, the more opportunities, you know, happen for you. So it's kind of like... You know, the, the harder I work, the luckier I get, right? <laughs> well, the more you share yourself about your vision, your values, and your mission, the more good things that that happen in general. So that would be like 
one of the main reasons why every you know executive or leader or you know business owner should do it but more importantly why you should do it on linkedin is really the the next question i think that people are probably asking and so why linkedin is because there is in the us alone over 300 million active users which is pretty incredible and then in, in, in including you know for people who are in the niche that this podcast is about for legal and so yeah. what is the number one source for most lawyers of new business it is referrals and if you would like to have more for referrals staying top of mind with your existing warm network is a good way of getting more referrals because <laughs> they go hey if your name's tom and they go oh there's tom again he's really helpful i've been meaning to do an introduction to tom again but this and half the time it's from other lawyers and so it's just ref lawyers referring more business to other lawyers because one lawyer is you know an immigration specialist and another one does family law and we all specialize as we go down and you want to kick it to the people you know and the only way you kick it to the people you know is those who show up regularly. And it doesn't matter how you go about doing it, whether it's networking events offline or online, or if you have a gifting campaign or snail mail, lumpy mail, like this is just another one of those ways to do it. And it's so easy to do today. Why wouldn't you do that? You know, do you really want to get in an airplane and fly to the next event? <laughs> <laughs> to you know you get much more reach and even if you are doing this, this is a nice way the salt and pepper in between so that'd be the bare minimum of the reasons why you show up but linkedin can also be a very very powerful place for lead generation which is the other main goal for most solar practitioners or small legal firms they're like how do i get me some more leads <laughs> Right. right. They're like, I need some predictable leads. Referrals are great, but man, so, you know, one month I'm busy, the next month I don't even know if I'm gonna make payroll. <laughs> you know, or you know, and they just want to smooth out the edges. Well, a good way of doing that is creating content and getting it seen by others. And LinkedIn is a great place to do that because the partners that you meet there are usually like one to many type selling, especially when it comes to B2B, or there's always an element to that. Or even if you don't, it's an underappreciated network. So for example, you know, I have some clients and and they are in family uh, law, um, which usually means, you know, things like divorce. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the, when you do the family law and you're a lawyer that does that, you want clients who have something to divvy up. And so you can create content that is for other people who happen to have more money. Well, how would you target that? Well, you target by based on job title. Are you a president? Are you a CEO? And you would share content. And you could even take that content and sponsor it just like you can on Facebook or Instagram. The only difference is on Facebook and Instagram, you're marketing to, you know, sometimes people who may not have anything to divvy up. And as, you know, a mentor of mine once told me, Matthew, sell things to rich people, solve rich people's problems, and you'll make a lot more money. And I'm not saying that's the mission. Some people are mission-driven, and there's different approaches to doing that. I have another client who's more mission-driven. Not everybody's a mercenary-type business owner where it's all about money. Right. And I think that's important. And I have you know, a woman who does immigration, and she's helping people you know, do some pretty amazing things things you know and and her specialty isn't actually helping uh women who are abused and have problems get new opportunities in another country and i think that's really powerful and linkedin's also just one of those places in addition to being on other platforms like instagram or facebook or showing up in search and so forth and the last one is like search is going away and so i previously had a search agency i did a lot of sem i actually serviced a lot of legal firms in the past and there's one place that is getting harder and harder and harder to to rank and if you had already been there in google maps or if you'd already been there in google like now it takes you forever to get seen well you don't have that problem when you're in social because you have a network so like on linkedin you know people and so you're going to get seen if you just post there's more opportunities faster that come your way or if you boost your content through content and make an offer to them there's more opportunities for you to get more business as well too faster than you would from another platform now i'm not saying you shouldn't do search marketing or you shouldn't do you know facebook or instagram or tiktok marketing i think you should do all of those things but sometimes you want to look at where's the unfair advantage for me 
Where can I get one to many sales? Where can I get more referrals? Where can, you know, and if you look at even just the referrals, like, look, it's going to be your number one closing rate. You know, someone who's cold, it doesn't know you, doesn't trust you. But if you get a referral inherently, your closing rate is going to be higher. Right. right. And so I would want to lean into these things. What are things that one multiply me two allow me to do one to many selling three lean into my unfair advantage, make it easier for me to close sales like these. This would be the filter that I'd be using. And when you start using this filter and you start thinking about it and you really look at all the opportunities that, you know, uh, uh, um, a law firm owner can do, you know, a lot of times they miss the one, which is like, whoa, LinkedIn's like kind of like this crazy place that could bring in a lot of business for me. And so those are some of the things that I've noticed um, that are working for them and why they should be on LinkedIn and why they should be creating content. Yeah, it makes sense to me. And I don't know about all the different algorithms and all the things like I, I don't pretend to to follow all of that. But I've noticed just, you know, by being on the platform, it feels like people see my stuff on LinkedIn longer, like stuff just seems to live has like a long life cycle, like somebody liked a post today that I feel like I posted three or four weeks ago. And I'm like, wow, that thing's still kind of hopping along. And so it just feels like a easy place for professionals to start to maybe compared to some of the other places where you're trying to get seen. I think that's a great point. And in addition to that, you know, what's wonderful about LinkedIn is it's a really safe place. Most people on LinkedIn have it tied to a professional profile. It's not like Harry, Tom, 1984, right? Right. Just, you just don't run into as many trolls or people who are going to be negative. So if you're like a little bit scared about getting on social media or you've heard like nightmare stories, well, not, not on LinkedIn. You know, and and as long as you're creating helpful content, you're going to be okay. And 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 so people always ask me, well, well, what is helpful content? What do you mean by this? Well, helpful content is 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 not about you or the services that you're providing. It's really about the problems that you solve. And so, a simple way of creating this content is you simply just start with like who you're speaking to and what is the problem that they're experiencing. And just by doing that, immediately does something that's called dog whistle copy, which then those people who have that problem are going to pay attention to, and those that don't are, are not going to pay attention to it, which is fine. So, if, you know, for example, if you're saying, hey, you know, um, you know, one of the biggest problems for business owners who are CEOs and founders going through a divorce is how do they you know, how do they divide up the business? Right. <laughs> right. And so that, that would be an entry point of hook. So then anybody and who is, like I say, are going to be like, whoa, I'm, I'm happened to be in a rough place or things are not going as planned in the business. And then they, and then you would say, okay, well, here are all the bad things that can go wrong or I've seen go wrong. It's called agitate. So problem agitate and you say but however you know um this is how we've solved it in the past for some of our clients that made both parties really happy or here is how i would solve it if there was this situation or here are all your different options right or let me tell you a story about you know we'll just call them bob and mary here's how they solved it and so when you go from problem to agitate to solve you build a lot of trust and you're helpful and because you led with the individual's audience problem you attracted the right people and repelled the wrong people now we could do this again and let's just say that we took an example of like let's say you you're an immigration lawyer and let's just say that you deal with um we're to stay on this theme of entrepreneurs but maybe you do some sort of like eb5 visa right where you're helping other business owners who want to come to the united states and it's a good visa. Like I know a lot of lawyers who charge anywhere from twenty to fifty thousand dollars to process this visa, you know. And but it's very important to some people. They want to give an opportunity to their family. It's an easy way to get their family coming to the U.S. They can start a business. I don't know. I, I'm not an expert of understanding it all, but you get right. yeah. You, you just yeah. start with that, and you say, "Here's the things that go wrong if you don't set this up right." Here's how we recently did this for Sally and her family, right? And you could go through telling that story, and again, it follows that format of creating helpful content. It's actually technically called the PAS formula, which is just problem, agitate, solve. And if you do that, it's really helpful. And then if you if you want inbound leads, you just pair it with like a little bit of bait, which is known as a lead magnet in the marketing world or aka marketing collateral and you say by the way i also have this really cool thing that's going to make things easier for you or by the way i've got this free assessment where you can see if you'd qualify for an eb5 visa why don't you fill it out today or hey if you are going through this take my you know my forum on how to negotiate fairly on the business or how maybe it could even be something small like how do you share this with your business partners 
How do you share with your business partners that you're going through a divorce and this might impact things or all, all, all kinds of things like this? You, there's so many different angles you could go about doing it. And you can even do it at a BC level. So for example, maybe you help with work visas or you go into the HR department or I've had a client that specifically just focuses in on immigration and they do um, the immigration that's the H1s and the H1Bs and they help you know temporary workers help farm the land in, in America. And if you didn't have that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have your tomatoes, you know, right. this, this season, like you, this is a very important work to be done. Or there's people who just are not interested in doing certain work. And in, in Canada, we had people who weren't willing to work at Tim Hortons and at Starbucks. We, we needed people. Like someone's got to pour you coffee. Those donuts, right? right? That's right. And so you, you can, again, you can go into the HR department and help them set up those, uh, the ability to be able to bring in temporary workers or student visas. And then there's, you know, an array of different ways that you can go about doing this, but this, this, this is, you know, how you talk about the content, how you make it helpful. I mean, if you do that, you kind of, you feel happy about your content and you feel proud of it, even if you're uncomfortable doing it. And then when you're helpful like that, you, you attract more good things that come to you. And if you stay consistent with it, and if you get really strategic with it, where you sponsor it, make sure it's seen by the right audience. So just imagine, you know, you taking your content and then pairing it perfectly. So if you're speaking to HR, overworked HR departments are trying to keep up with filling the staff or people turn over, they just keep quitting for whatever reason. Well, just imagine if you took that content and you guaranteed for it to be seen every time they logged into LinkedIn. Well, they're going to start to see you. They're going to get to know you. They're going to get to like you. And eventually they're going to trust you. So then when they reach out to you, they're already pre-sold. Right. Because you've been whispering in their ear over a long period of time. And so it's a little bit of the long game, but some people fast track themselves and end up in your sales pipeline earlier. But if you keep doing it, it works really well. Just even think about all the listeners who are on this podcast. If you've been listening to this for a long time with Stephanie, I guarantee you, if you saw Stephanie at the next event or somewhere else, you're going to like literally feel like you know her right? As opposed to like, not, not right. Yeah, the other sure. way around. It's very, very powerful that, that whispering. And so doing this on a consistent basis and building that type of brand, right? Um, as an expert in your niche is very, very valuable, valuable. It makes, it makes, it makes, it gives you an unfair advantage and it makes all your other marketing work better. Yeah. All you know? of that. Yeah. All of that resonates and, and tracks, I'm curious, I'm going to get real specific for a second, because okay. I feel like I see a lot of people on LinkedIn right now, and all the your post makes sense to me, but I feel like everyone's asking a question at the end because they want that engagement. They're like trying to invite people, come have a conversation, like basically put a comment in, like, because I, and I assume that's because that's going to boost in the algorithm's mind, but I'm also just kind of curious what your advice is and, and how, like, is there some... Yeah, so what you're talking about is actually a CTA at the end of your post. And CTA just stands for call to action for those people who are not marketers. And so you should always have a call to action, but only one call to action. And it depends on what it is that you want to do. And you want to pair it with the type of piece of content it is. And so really there's four different types of content that you can create. There's authority. I call it the ACES method. Okay, so A is for authority content. That's what you want to be known for as an expert in your vertical, your niche. Okay. Two is C, okay? So that is connect content. That's anything that hits the heart, the gut, or the funny bone. Like we want to know you're a real person who cares about real things and experiences real things in life, right? Yeah. <laughs> like just like we, you know, we can't, we can't, if we, we, we can't trust if we don't like you, right? We can't like if we don't know you, right? So you got to show up first, get known, then you got to have sometimes have connect pieces of content. The third one is engagement content. That's, that's, that's the E, okay? And what that is, is you don't have to be the knower of all things. You just need to be a good host. And so if you ask a question, it could be like, hey, which logo do you like? This one or that one? Or, hey, I'm running into this problem. Does anybody know a good accountant? Or you'd be like, here's what I think. What do you think? Like, you, any way you want to engage it is good in getting a conversation. Just remember, conversions happen in conversations. And you don't have to be the knower of all things. And this is why creating content is easier than people think. Just ask questions. And the last one is show. And so what I mean by this is we don't want to tell people how awesome we are. You don't tell and sell, you show and sell. And show is content where you show before and after as results you had, client stories, client case studies, 
things like that, is the content. So once you figure out what the content is you're, you're doing, then it, you decide on what CTA you want to have at the end. And sometimes it might be to comment below. Now, some people put the comment below because they think that it's improving the algorithm, but it has nothing to do with improving the algorithm. So yes, when you have more threaded contents that have meat to it, that is good and you will get more reach with your content, but that's not why you're going to get more reach. All you need to understand about all social media, does not matter whether you're on LinkedIn or not, is they only care about one thing, okay? So LinkedIn only cares about one thing, which is keeping people on LinkedIn longer. Mm -hmm. And so what they're going to do is they're going to reward content that keeps people on LinkedIn longer. And so you just have to adhere to that rule. If you do that, then, then you will find that your content does better. Okay. And so I can get into all the different tactics and things you can do, but as long as you understand that's their agenda, and as long as you adhere to that agenda, that's good. Now you have a secondary agenda, which is your ideal customer. And so right. you have to go, you have to think about what, what is LinkedIn want or what's going to, and so what's going to keep them there? If you think about it, here's how the LinkedIn algorithm works as they go, who is this person connected to? Okay. Are they a first connection? And then two, have they engaged with that content before? If the answer is yes, then the likelihood is they're going to engage with it again right? And therefore, they're going to show that to that person again. Now, if that person did not engage with your content where they stayed longer on site, they will not show your content again to them again. Like, they'll just go, that's, that's, I'm not going to show it to them. Now, if there is no content to show them, they'll default to the first connection. So they're looking for a pattern based on behavior of your followers and or connections. And of course, like some content goes further, but the reason why why comments work is if it's a meaty comment and there's conversations happen, what do you end up doing? You're staying longer on that piece of content. Therefore, they're going to show more of it to the next person, right? So this is even a reason why like sometimes I sponsor organic content as a paid ad and we start getting threaded comments of the con content is really meaty underneath that ad, I will never delete that ad. I'll continue to keep leveraging it because it has so much social proof and there's so much meat. I know it's sticking there, which then increases my quality score, which decreases my cost per click to be able to get things. So there, there are particular tactics and strategies that you can use to go really, really deep on doing this. But, but for most people who are listening to this podcast, all they need to understand is LinkedIn only cares about one thing, which is keeping people on LinkedIn. Don't worry about all the algorithm and or when it changes, it doesn't matter. All you need to care about is who's your ideal audience, how are you being helpful to them? And then two, how do I keep them on LinkedIn longer? And if I adhere to those two rules, I'll create content that that makes sense. And I will always, generally speaking, be rewarded well for doing that. Yeah, I love how simple you just made it. I think everybody, because we do, we get it all up in our heads and we're worried. How, you know, how am I going to show up? How am I going to, what am I going to say? I have so many people that are like, oh, I, I know I need a post, but I just get stuck. And yeah, um, I mean, I know you help with that too. That's actually your job. But I love that you also are just like, guys, just get out there and start talking about problems you solve change algorithms change i've seen people lose their facebook accounts lose their rankings overnight like you can't obsess about these things and generally speaking when you do lose it it's because you got really spammy and tactical and overdid something mm -hmm. right like i've seen i've seen clients when i did i see them like do dirty backlinking and it worked for years and then all of a sudden boom they got a slap and apparently or i've seen people do it with facebook like and it's because they they're over optimizing for some tactic or hack that just doesn't pay off instead of just looking at what's what's the long game here what are we really trying to do i'm trying to build an audience i'm trying to build trust i'm trying to get people into my database i'm trying to add value and it's because you're just thinking too short term and yeah. you know it's it's normal i've made the mistake a million times myself like if you're making the mistake you're not alone and sometimes when you're starting out you know, you're in reaction mode and you're saying like, you need that money. You will, you're desperate. You'll try anything. And if it's working, you're going to lean into it. Right. But if you can step back when you catch your breath and remind yourself what it's really all about, yeah. <laughs> it's really just about being helpful, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. No, this has been great. I want to shift because I, I definitely want to ask you this other kind of line of questioning because I, I've, okay. and I, and I've had the benefit of taking part, I haven't finished it, but I've been taking your online course. And oh, so awesome. Oh, I didn't um, even know you were in there. That's great. Yeah. I want to learn um, your top tips. I know you have a bunch of them, but I'm going to challenge you. Like what are the top three or four things you think we should be thinking about when it comes to our profile? Because I think this is another place where people get tripped up or worried. And, and I think you make it pretty simple. Sure. So, so I always look at it as the 80-20 rule. And so your LinkedIn profile is important, but it's not as important as you think it is. 
<laughs> and so what I mean by this is how do people get to your profile? So if I look at like, you know, if I get a hundred thousand, you know, impressions on some of my content in a month, you know, I'll have 2000 profile visits. So we'll call it 2% of the people end up back at my profile. And that's like pretty standard. It's really low. Yeah. Right, really, really low. So, where are people really consuming the content? They're consuming it in the news feed. So then you have to think, well, what parts of my LinkedIn profile show up in the news feed? And the elements are your profile photo and your headline. So this is your LinkedIn headline. Usually, what people put in is their job title and the company they work for in their headline. But you can make it actually anything that you want. And so you can look at: is this an opportunity to sell? Who I help and how I help? And I think if they can't quickly tell. Then, then that's going to be important. The second thing that you can have is you can have a feature in there where you can actually have like visit my website as a button just underneath, but only if you activate it. So if I was looking at like what is the most important thing, you want to get those three things right. So make sure you have a headshot. Make sure it's a nice headshot of you where you're looking at the camera, the eyes are to the window, and that you're smiling. You can actually test your headshot on a website called Photo Feeler. Yes, I and did you, this. I did yeah. this on your advice. Oh, good. And <laughs> you can find out if you're likable or not by strangers. And the reason yes. why you want to use Photo Feeler is because of strangers and they don't know you. If you ask your friends and family and the people you know, they're biased based on knowing you, which is not really fair. Generally speaking, it's strangers who see you. So you get it validated based on strangers and you can find out you know, how likable you are. Or how for just based on your your headshot your your profile photo so I think that's a good way of doing that and then you can do the same thing with your 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 header your header line is you can figure out I like to do the formula of who you help and how you help like I help like get aspiration without blank fear or frustration like that's usually the formula I like to use and then of course if you just turn the button on that says you know come visit my website you'll get people who come visit your website or you can put the button that says book a consultant you, usually people who want to book time with you yet but depending on you know your structure and your marketing funnel and how you want to go about doing it you, I would make that so if you get that part right that's gonna be amazing some other highlights on your profile is the header image like have one uh, you know, if someone gets back there, that's what we're going to see. Write your bio in first person. Use the featured section that you can have to create an offer. You know, ensure that all your your employment history filled out. Try to attach, um, you know, case studies and assessments to it, which you can do. And of course, have recent recommendations. So, like for example, if you come to my profile today, you'll see over eighty people who've recommended me, who are busy executives, CEOs, lawyers, you know, et cetera, business owners. They're all like, "Yo, Matt's like the bomb," and they go into detail about like my course they go into detail about my consulting or they go into the detail about our done for you services where we help you know busy executives create all of their social media content from a one hour monthly interview you'll see like all that stuff in there that it becomes undeniable social proof that when someone's thinking about doing business with me they, there's no question in why like it just stops the reference checking they're just like holy crap and there's new ones like every month right so 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 those things yes you can do but when i look at like the 80 20 you know what's the tw what's the 20 percent that's going to move the needle get your profile right get your head right head, your headline right and get the button right because as long as you're creating content that's where they're going to see it most now if you can do the other part amazing like kudos to you you're a rock star and it is just a one-time activity really so taking yeah. a day to get it all organized is a good investment yeah, that's what I did. I took your course. I did the photo feeler thing. It was fascinating to see what these people said about yeah. you know, the, where, where I scored on my three. I put in three different headshots because I was curious. Yeah. And it yeah. was it was just amazing. Um, and yeah, and I tweaked some of my stuff. So, I mean, here's the here's a good fun challenge. If you're listening, go check out my LinkedIn page because I want some um, LinkedIn uh, love here. But tell me what you think. How did I do following <laughs> Matt's uh, guidance there. <laughs> what do they have to search for you, Stephanie? You got to tell them what they're going to search for when they're on LinkedIn. Oh. Stephanie, what? I mean, I think it's just Stephanie Everett, lawyerist. I don't know. I mean, I should know my, <laughs> I should have been prepared. I was not, you guys. I did not. Um, hopefully you all know. But yeah, my like page is Stephanie A. Everett is, is my, I was where I, how I show up on LinkedIn. That's awesome. And if you search Matthew Hunt, you know, or Matthew Hunt LinkedIn, you'll find me in LinkedIn, pretty sure. Or even if you search it on Google, it'll show up Matthew Hunt LinkedIn. You'll see that there's something in there about me. Yeah. And I hope um, I hope everybody, because he kind of was th flying through all those so quickly, I, but I'm going to pull one out, which is don't waste such valuable space in your headline by just saying lawyer, attorney. I see that so often. And it's just not, 
it's just not helpful, right? And that's, as I said at the top of this interview, the whole reason I connected to Matthew is, I don't know, I was on LinkedIn one day and I saw his headline and I was actually in the the market. For, I knew I wanted to do more on LinkedIn. And so I clicked in, I was like, what is this snackable content? Let me, you know, but it was his headline that I saw because you posted on, I don't even remember now where you posted, you commented something, something happened that got my attention, but it was, it was that headline that drew me to you and is the reason we're talking right now. So don't miss that opportunity to tell people who you help and how you help them in that really valuable space. That's right. And when you comment, it shows up. So when you're commenting, that's where that photo and headline matters. And in commenting is content. I always recommend even before you start creating content, learning how to comment and creating the habit of commenting is actually a good place to start. And when you comment, it's not like great post or thank you. It's you have to actually add something in value. So usually you can compliment like the post, but then like curious, add by asking a question, then add something useful afterwards that adds to the conversation. It's a great way of doing a good comment. It takes a little more than like 10 seconds to do. You might need to spend, you know, two or three minutes, but a good comment on a good profile can drive a lot of business back to you. So it's, it's yeah. worth, it's a, it's a good exercise. Like a lot of times we're in scroll holes at home, you know, well, instead of getting on the Instagram or TikTok scroll hole, why don't you get into the LinkedIn scroll hole and, and don't just, you know, surf, uh, anonymously, like, you know, most people secretly creep everything, like actually just take a minute and make a comment. And you'd be surprised if you did 10 of those a day over the course of like a year, how much new business that can drive you and how much more new awareness. And that's not even like creating your own content, just commenting and participating in the LinkedIn community can be very, very powerful. Yeah. I mean, like I just told everybody, I was I was kind of beating myself up at the end of the summer. I was like, I got to I got to do better on LinkedIn. I've kind of let it go for a while. I'm going to get back involved. And I noticed, you know, just by commenting, I, I started commenting, I started doing a few things. And it was surprising how quickly some people with that I didn't know with bigger following started commenting on my things. And that, so I was like, wow, I'm like, okay, this is, and I know it's a long game. So I, I don't want people to think this is going to happen overnight, but it is encouraging when you start kind of seeing some of those results and you think, okay, there's, I could do this. There's, there's a, there's a path here. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you do it anyways. It's just like, how do you do it? I mean, everybody gets on social media and scroll hole today. How do you, how do you turn that you know, passively into something actively and something productive. This is a great way of going about doing it. Yeah. It's just like anything. It's just habit changing. Yeah. You know, we just get into these habits and then we just need to change the habits. And it, often people have the time. They're always like, I don't have time to comment. You know, and I bet you if you hand me your phone and I could look at your actual phone usage, I'd be like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, 30 minutes on Instagram today, two hours on YouTube. You're, you're telling me you don't have time to do 10 minutes a day add a couple comments, you've got time. We just need to redirect that energy differently. Yeah. yeah. And even busy lawyers, everybody falls for it. Everybody thinks they're busy. It doesn't matter if you have one kid or 10 kids. It doesn't matter if you have 30 employees or one employee. It doesn't matter. what. Everybody in their own world, they're the hero of their own story and everybody's busy yeah. <laughs> or feels busy or overwhelmed. Yeah, Usually sure. not true though. Because like if you add it up, you're like, well, how does Leon Musk get so much done? I'm not saying like he's the something we all aspire to be. Trust me, it's not my goals. His goals are not my goals. But damn, dude runs a lot of company, does a lot of things. So how does he get so much done with the same 24 hours? He's doing something different, right? Right. And we see use case of Oprah, same thing. You know, before she retired, she did a lot. So how was she doing all these things? Well, she just used her time better and leveraged it better. And media was definitely one of them. And so if you're not leveraging social media to multiply yourself, you're definitely not finding a lot of leverage in your life. For sure. I love it. All right. Um, this has been so helpful and I know we are taking away a lot of tips from this conversation. If people are interested in learning more about the specific work that you do, where should they go? Uh, yeah, they should go to demandy.com. Now, demandy is spelled a little different. It's demand, like D-E-M-A-N-D, -E and then it's I-I.com. So if you put in demandy.com, you'll find it. Or if you just go to like Google and you search Matthew Hunt, the way it's spelled with two Ts and Hunt, and then put in LinkedIn, you'll find my profile and you'll be able to in touch with me. If you message me on LinkedIn or if you come to the website, you'll be able to directly speak to me. I, I watch it like a hawk and I'm very responsive. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with me today. I have learned a lot and I'm headed to LinkedIn right now. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go comment on some things. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie.